had a couple of questions online, Claudio. Oh, ah, okay. One visitor says, Claudio says the bell and the neck are the most important. Is that for all saxophones, Ramponi, uh, Zani? What variable role does the bow play? I always thought the neck and the bow were the most important, and the bell played a much, much lesser role. I'm thinking of the reference 36 versus the 54 tenor. It seems to me that the bow and the neck is the main difference. Again, there isn't a, a university or a, uh, somebody who uh, can come out here with a paper saying this is the truth. I believe, and if we go back to the King Super 20, for instance, that's a clear sign that uh, Silver Neck, Silver Bell, those guys were very, very smart. They understood already many things uh, years ago. And from the ex experiment we made, so we made experiments making horns with uh, all in, in the same metal and then putting the neck in another metal and then the bell in another metal or the bow in another metal, we uh, get to the conclusion that uh, simply that, uh, I mean, uh, concretely live, that uh, uh, the neck and the bell are the two most important parts. So. This is coming, what I'm saying is coming mostly from, from my experience, it's not really a theory. A theory. Uh, probably because the beginning of the arc column is absolutely extremely important, but even the end of the column where the air goes out and, um, I mean, it's, I can tell you that uh, cha <laughs> changing, uh, changing um, bell and neck, you can get much higher differences, much bigger differences than working only on bow and, and the tube. I'm not saying that the, the, the body and the bow are not making differences because be, just before I told you that maybe even the pearls are making differences. But if you stay concentrated on neck and bell, those are the two most important parts of the sound tube to me. What I, can, uh, I could demonstrate it by playing or have this guy playing uh, an horn made uh, with the same metal uh, neck and bow, and the next one with the same metal neck and bell. So uh, this is coming from our experience. You have another question there? Or? One visitor wants to know exactly how does the big bore change the sound? The big or bore why? changes the uh, sound. More than changing the sound, is changing absolutely the sound as all the variables but what I like to explain to tell is that if you are able sometimes it's a little bit tricky or uh, challenging to deal with um, a bigger amount of air inside your air column the potentials of your sound are bigger you have more uh, more rumors more noise more more everything more complexity of sound in your in your uh, coming out from your horn. So this is, the direction of the big bore to me is more complexity of sound. And then being a bigger bore horn, because if our philosophy is uh, to produce all the saxophones pretty big uh, with bore, uh, it's to me going a little bit more on the dark, deep side of, of, the, of the sound. Maybe uh, I like to uh, just to say something which is strange, but just to give you an idea, um, clear idea. When I play my my alto compared to other altos, I feel it's closer to the tenor than others because I'm dealing with more air inside the tube. When I'm playing my tenor, it's very I like this very fat, like con more air inside and more things to say you know from from your sound when you have a bigger bore of course you, sometime not always but sometime you can have bigger uh, you know uh, you have to 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 manage with more air and so you have to understand how to deal with it and how to uh, control it so um, mostly it's this i think maybe we are almost one, done one more question Okay, the last question. Can I ask you to talk briefly about the um, tone hole placement 
with your instruments compared to other saxophones and the intonation? Mm -hmm. How do you approach that? Obviously, uh, tonal placement, this is the architecture of our saxophone is, it's another saxophone, so it's, for, to give you an idea, if you uh, have, if we will have here maybe three uh, Altus, one Selmer, one Yanagizawa, one Yama, for instance, and you take a neck, one of one of the three, and you try to test it all three with, uh, with one neck, it can happen that uh, it's pretty usual that you can test all the three saxophones with the same neck. You can't do the same with our uh, with our uh, horn because it's another philosophy. You know, you take this neck and uh, it will not fit the Selmer and vice versa here. So um, the architecture is different. So the tonal placement is very different. Even the the uh, the size and the shape of the octave chimney which is very important for high notes and also for balance of it's completely different so we had to develop uh, our tonals according to our intonation uh, in order to uh, get to a, a final compromise which was the to us the best and still we are we accept and we are open to players uh, to understand if maybe it's worth to move or to change a little bit the dimension the size of a tonal but uh, sometimes this is not easy because um, I completely uh, agree that the saxophone I love the saxophone because it's maybe between the winds having this uh, conical shape the most imperfect uh, uh, horn and the most and the closer the closest to uh, the human being like us that we are all imperfect and that's why there's a uh, oftenly you can i mean it's almost like a human voice coming out from the saxophone so uh, you go you try to you aim to uh, the best compromise but you'll never have the best intonation so it's pretty much sure that sometime when you blow into a bore a different bore like our bore in certain area of the horn the, the intonation is, uh, you know, maybe opposite than on another saxophone. I have specific areas uh, on the saxophone uh, that I know, maybe on Selmer again, they play pretty with tendons to be uh, um, sharp, and on our horn, they are a little flat. So they, you have to balance a little bit and you have to switch when if some, somebody decides to play a rampone for sure, maybe not everybody because sometimes it happens that the player is coming and playing our horn and it's like he was waiting for that since since ever next next player can tell me oh, listen here oh, i love the sound but maybe i don't feel because the intonation is strange and i i completely understand that because it's a different tube so you have to switch and uh, kind of like um, learning to drive a new car Maybe with, with that, we are done. I, we need to, well, I, I want to point out this last answer is one of the most honest answers I've ever heard from a saxophone manufacturer. Because the message is popped in with any instrument, pianos, guitars, uh, trombones. The, the answer of some question like this often that they, this company has made all the best choices for you. And that we've made the perfect uh, decision that will solve your problems. You put your problems on the intonation is great. I always see that advertisement back to the old MS, SMLs and things. Uh, intonation, we've improved and corrected all intonation problems. When in reality, the saxophone is uh, is an imperfect being. And so companies have to make a decision. If we do this to put this here, then this is going to have to be here. And then the player has to decide which, they, they, which way they choose to compensate. And this is the... Uh, there's a learning curve on every instrument, and I'll be the first to tell you when the first time I picked up a red pony, um, I had real issues with some of the areas of it, and it was it took a while to find the, the one I really liked, and uh, over the years they, they have changed in little minuscule ways, but the, the answer is, is, is clear to what the, the Claudio said because of the unique uh, quality of their instrument. They, they make choices that are, make it a red pony horn, and other companies make other choices, and you ultimately, as the player, have to decide where you're, you're going to compensate this for that. It's, it's a great Maybe uh, I'd like to uh, show you uh, our last uh, creature, which is the Altello. And uh, again, Chris was so uh, kind to borrow me his one because I couldn't bring more stuff from Italy. <laughs> and 
that's the uh, prototype in fact uh, because Chris was surprisingly uh, stuck on this <laughs> and he didn't want to hear uh, to me uh, because I was trying to sell him the gold-plated one but no no I want the <laughs> I'm joking but uh, in fact uh, he was so close to this horn because uh, he helped us to develop it and he gave us ideas uh, different ideas and uh, I'm really proud he decided to buy this and uh, this is rough brass uh, the brass we use for our um, R1 Jazz, uh, it's the prototype, so it's no number, and uh, I'm really proud that he's playing with it. So, if you maybe like to test it or uh, to uh, blow some notes, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and this again was another, uh, you know, in our ideas was uh, a way to give uh, more chances, more options to alto players. To express their music I uh, to me one of the best compliments uh, is when um, players uh, tell us after a while they bought the horn that uh, their music changed a little bit because the, uh, the um, sound of our horns pushed them to write something different and to play something different 